Recent examples of some of the access that Peter King was able to get developed over 40 years in the craft. Peter announced this morning. To the amazement of many, Peter, this is what I was telling my wife this last night. A decent number of people knew you were retiring. Not a whole lot, but enough. And it reaches a critical mass where somebody who knows says something to one of the various reporters who cover sports media. Everybody respected your wishes. Nobody blabbed. In an age of ever-increasing willingness by folks to blab, that's the most impressive aspect of all of it, that you are able to maintain it and drop it on your own terms and walk away with your announcement this morning in Football Morning in America. And good morning. Good morning, Mike. You act like me retiring matters. I mean, you know, let's, you know, <clears throat> or like it's some huge bit of news. Yeah. And and look, I... Uh, it is. What I've <laughs> Peter, done. it is. And I... It is. Oh, I mean... <laughs> You don't know, sell yourself I, short. I, I'm, it I'm is. A, I don't sell myself short. I know I did a good job, or at least I think I did, but I'm a reporter. I'm not somebody who you go to see. I'm somebody who you go to read. But but besides all that, beside all that, you know, I I am, um, you know, I'm really kind of humbled at your words and at a lot of people's words uh, about me walking away. But, you know, Mike, I just think that as I have watched this life, this world, so many of my peers who either die on the job or don't go out on their own terms. And, you know, I I was saying to Mike Reese, I just texted Mike Reese of ESPN Boston this morning because he texted me with a real nice text and he said, hey, I... I think some of your greatest stuff was this year. I I really enjoyed it. And I said, you know, the one thing I really wanted to do this year more than anything else is I wanted nobody to be able to say, man, he's mailing it in this year. I could see he was, he was done. He was, he was out. And I just felt like I really wanted, and I kind of knew for some time that this was going to be it. I wasn't positive, but I, I knew that it probably was. And I just never wanted anybody to say he mailed it in. That was really kind of my big goal this last year. But anyway, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I don't think anybody could ever accuse you of mailing anything in. You mentioned in the column at one point our mutual boss, Sam Flood, suggested that maybe you cut from 10,000 words back to 6,000, and you're just not wired to do that. And that caused me, because I know how much you like numbers, I tried to do the math, and I suspect you have at some point. Between Monday morning quarterback and football morning in America, the number of words written, because you (laughs) did it every week of the year with the exception of four or five. I mean, I don't know what the over-under is. I assume that one of the various betting apps would set a line at the over-under. It's got to be a lot of words, like in the millions. The question is how many millions? The ki- you know what I said to someone uh, recently who said, "Hey, maybe you'll maybe you'll write a book." I, I mean, you must have a great book in you. I said, T- "There's two things about that. I, what have I hidden? What have I kept, uh, you know, in some notebook in my office that I haven't used? I just, I, I, I mean, I open my notebook every week." And just tell you everything that I know and everything that I think. So I don't really have that. Plus, <clears throat> here's the other thing. I write the equivalent of a, you know, an 80 to 100,000 word novel every 8 to 10 weeks. So it's not exactly like, you know, when I walk away, I want to sit down. Hey, let's write 100,000 words in the next few weeks and write a book. So, you know, I haven't really thought very much about doing that. And who knows? I may at some point, but I, uh, I think I'm for a while, I'm probably just going to do nothing. But Peter, one thing I've learned, once you develop the capacity to write well and write quickly, and you write far better than I do, but once you stretch that rubber band, you realize how easy it is to redirect it to other things. During the pandemic, I started screwing around with fiction and 
and it flows. And once you learn how to make it flow, it doesn't matter what it is that you're writing about. You have that capacity. And I love the fact that your retirement comes with an asterisk because you're not walking off into the sunset. We're going to hear from Peter King in some way, shape, or form. He's just going to take some time to figure it out. That's the thing that makes me not sad and emotional. Like I was trying to think of a good Seinfeld reference and I thought of the one where he says, what is this salty discharge? And it's like, I'm not going to cry today. <laughs> King isn't going away. He's just stepping yeah. aside. So the better reference for today is you're Kramer and you're walking in with your hundred bucks and you're slapping it on the table and you're saying, I'm out. But I'm out. Kramer was that's never a, really that's out. very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he wasn't. Hey, look, you know, Mike, there's something about it. Part of me is sad because nothing will replace sitting in the winning coach's office after the Super Bowl and having having him tell me, hey, here's Corn Dog and here's what we did with Kadarius Tony and Sky Moore. Nothing will replace here's Tom and Jerry and here's why Nicole Hardman came from a season of awfulness you know, with the Jets and with us and why he's now the hero of the Super Bowl. I mean, there's something about that and the fact that in five or six hours after I stand up in that office and walk away that I'm going to be able to tell the world about it. Nothing will ever replace that for me. Nothing. It's what I have loved to do my whole life. And, And that's why, you know, to me, you know, riding to work with Kyle Shanahan the week before the Super Bowl and talking to him about a lot of the real deep stuff in his life. I mean, these are the things that I got into the business to begin with. And and look, of course, I'm going to miss doing them without any question. But those are the kind of things that if you have this immense curiosity and if you have this work ethic, if you have this drive and you're listening to me now, and you're at Ohio University or University of Missouri, well, you're probably asleep still. But it, you know, if, you, if you're listening to me at any of these great journalism schools in the country, I'm telling you, you can do it. And the reason you can do it is because, just look at me, I'm not Rick Riley, Frank DeFord, Curry Kirkpatrick, you know, any of the, you know, Steve Russian, I'm not any of the Tom Verducci. I'm not any of the truly great writers in any way, shape, or form. I just was able to do it because I would look around a press box on a Sunday in 1992, 98, 2000, you know, and I would just say mentally, I would literally, I would say this to myself almost every day. I'm going to write the best story of anybody in this room today. Uh, and, And sometimes I did. <clears throat> and a lot of times I didn't, but that was my thought process going into every day that I did this job. Well, and again, number one, you're selling yourself short as a writer, which is fine. That's for me to say, not you to say, and that's fu- that, that will be fine. But the other thing that you bring to the table and you touch on this in your column this morning, the sacrifices that need to be made in order to do the job well. And I know we're both a bunch uh, of a couple of old men preaching to the youngsters that don't want to hear it. And it dawned on me last week. I remember hearing it when I was young and I didn't want to hear it. But even though I didn't want to hear it, it got through and it kind of sunk in and it waited to spread at the right time. The idea that you aren't going to get anything unless you bust your ass. You can have all the talent in the world, but you just sit around and do nothing. It doesn't matter. You have to put in the work. You have to have the drive. You have to have the will. You have to have an element of competition. And you've got a strong element of competition. You've done a very good job of naturally concealing it over the years. It's not as obvious as it might be for others. But as you said, you look around the press box and you want to kick everybody's ass that day. And you have to have that mindset in order to put in the work. There were times when we stayed at the same hotel and we shared a wall and I could hear you up talking on the damn phone until three in the morning and I'm trying to sleep. I wanted to bang on the walls. Hey, Peter, shut the hell up. I'm trying to sleep over here. I mean, you would go on Sunday night until three, four in the morning to get your column done. Hey, you know that it just really reminds me and you, you talk about this, Mike and, and look, 
All of these things you have to have, in my opinion, to be good in this business. You have it. You post stuff at 4.30 in the morning and, and all your, and your staff, Michael David Smith and Shireen and Miles. I mean, all of your people are worker bees too. But I've always felt this way too. Did I not enjoy it? Well, you know, at 3.30 in the morning, I didn't particularly enjoy it. But did I enjoy virtually everything about the job at, at all times? Absolutely. And you know what, Mike? You know when I really knew that I probably need to go? You know how every year, like I would always have a little grid when I was going to the scouting combine. And I would have like 30 targets that I wanted to spend time with. You know, like last year, my big target was Ryan Poles. They got the first pick in the draft and all that. And you know when I really knew, this was probably November, December, when I really knew was that I said, I got to retire before the combine. And, you know, you say, well, geez, why do you have to do that? I said, because... I don't really want to go to the Combine now. It isn't that it isn't an incredibly valuable place to get work done. It's fantastic. But the point is, I just really don't want to stay up until 1, 1 every morning for four or five days. Because at the Combine, that's what you do. And I just, I'm done. I'm done with sacrificing everything in order to spend a half hour with a general manager who's got the fifth pick in the draft. And again, that it's not to, I hope that there are a hundred people at the combine who have the desire that I had three, four, six, seven years ago when I would do that every year, I'd make my little grid. But you know, you reach different stages in life where you don't want to do those things anymore. And that's when you kind of know. And I really feel like if that's part of it, I should not be doing this job anymore. It belongs to the people who are really effing excited about going to the combine and running into Matt Eberflus in the hallway and buttonholing him with three questions. I mean, that that's the combine experience, and it's fantastic. But, you know, I, I, I've done it. See, that's where I could be really snarky and say no one's excited about running into Matt Eberflus, including Mrs. Eberflus, but just, <laughs> that's just popped into my head. I don't really mean it. It's just an opportunity that I didn't want to let go to waste. You know, I offered to make the whole show a trip down Peter King memory lane like your, remember no. the old This Is Your no. Life show, but Peter didn't want no. that. Peter, I got no. one thing more to say, though, before we get to the news, because there is news to get to as we get yeah. ready to head to the scouting combine, or at least I get ready to. I don't want to go either. At least, at least you got a good excuse. You're retired. I don't enjoy it. I'm flat out willing to say it. I hate it. I hate going. I hate that week. It's exhausting. It wears you out. I, my, my, I have one objective on my, on my list. Come home. So uh, anyway, yeah, I'm well. I get I'm, to I'm, Friday I'm not ready afternoon. Retire, says Mike. I don't. I don't <laughs> like. I don't like the scouting combine, and I never have. Okay. Um. So so the one thing you know because we cover a next man up sport. And one of the things that has occurred to me over the years, every football team is a giant machine with interchangeable parts. And when one goes, another one gets put in its place and it just keeps rolling. Peter, you know, you won't be replaced at least not until somebody grows into what you've been able to do. There isn't going to be somebody riding with one of the coaches in the Super Bowl on the way to work next year there isn't going to be somebody sitting with Andy Reid when he wins his third straight Super Bowl having him walk through whatever you know hot pretzel with mustard play that they come up with to try to win the game it's just not going to happen somebody might get there somebody might get there but it ain't going to happen this year that's for damn sure there isn't anybody who covers the sport that can do what you do and that is 100% unvarnished truth and I don't know how many people even know how to get there it's not like there's somebody who's just a year or two away. Like what you've been able to do, and we talked about this last week, you know, the 40 years that you've put in, the relationships you've built allows you to do the things you've done in recent years. It's a culmination of what you've put into the craft and how people have trusted you over years. And, and you've gotten along with people, you get along with people far better than I do. And that's all re resulted in 
what you've been able to do. And there's nobody who's going to be able to do it. It's just gone until somebody else develops the way you did, the kind of network, the kind of trust, the kind of respect that allows them to do it. So I don't expect it to happen anytime soon. I don't expect it to happen before I walk off into the sunset. That's for damn sure. Well, I appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. I guess I would just say two things. Number one, there's a reason why I request, why I asked Andy Reid uh, when I saw him in training camp in early August in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. And I asked him, hey, listen, if you win it this year, I want to do the same thing. He says, okay, you know, as we did last year. So he kind of knew it was coming if they if they won. But Mike, there's one there's a reason and and it's why when I wrote my column today, I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I've known Andy Reid since 1995. When he walked up to me at a Green Bay Packers training camp and said and I'm this is not exact quotes, but he basically said, "Man, I went to college to be able to do your job. I went to Brigham Young. I wanted to write for Sports Illustrated. That was my goal." And obviously, my life took a different turn and all that stuff. But when your relationship with somebody starts like that, and then here we are almost 30 years later, and, uh, you know, I had told Andy that I think this this is going to be it. And on Friday, when I was the pool reporter out at uh, Kansas City practices this week for the pro football writers, uh, Andy walked over to me on the sidelines and says, come with me. This is on Friday, uh, late morning, early afternoon. He said, come with me. And I walked out onto the field and I stood with him and Michael Vick watching Patrick Mahomes five yards behind him, watching Patrick Mahomes run a 10-play red zone drive, uh, or 10 plays in the red zone, and standing there with Michael Vick and watching all this stuff and and then Andy sort of looked at me at the end and he said, okay, you can go back. But he just wanted me to be able to experience something really that nobody else could experience. And so I'm grateful for that. But Mike, it can be done. It absolutely unequivocally can be done. But I will just say this in warning. This is not 1995 covering the NFL anymore. There are barriers put up. There are walls put up it's a lot more difficult to be able to form the kind of relationships that working for Sports Illustrated, I was able to form. When in 1991, I went into the Dallas Cowboys locker room when they were at the beginning their their dynasty, at the height of their, starting to get to the height of their greatness. And I went over to talk to Michael Irvin and he goes, Peter, and he, he yells at the top of his lungs, hey guys, we're in a Sports Illustrated game this week. We're in an effing Sports Illustrated game this week. And everybody sort of looked over, and there's Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith, Novacek, all these guys. And so, but the point is, it, that's not there anymore. People have to figure out other ways to get inside teams, to get to know players. And look, Mike, I'm just telling you, somebody will do it. People will do it. It's just going to be hard. Well, and that leads to one final point. I swear this is the last one before we get to the news of the day. The proliferation of media owned by teams, media owned by the league. You touch on that in your column. We had an item yesterday about an interview of Michael Bidwell, the owner of the Cardinals, by the flagship radio station that touched on none of the hot button issues involving that franchise for the past 12 months. None of them, not a single one. Not a single one. And Kyle Odegaard, who used to work for the Cardinals, peeled back the curtain and said, hey, I lived this for eight years. There's certain things you can't touch. There's certain things you can't say. There's certain things you can't do. Independence, significant independence in media, the way Sports Illustrated was, where there weren't tentacles that allowed the NFL to directly or indirectly try to shape things or complain to your bosses or otherwise do things to intimidate you so you would behave the way that the people on the payroll behave. That's part of the impediment today. That strong voice of independence isn't there because everybody, to some degree, is in a relationship where they either are compromised or they're not acting like they're as compromised as they really are, and it's a constant fight 
against those who are in a position at 345 Park Avenue to try to shape and mold things a certain way. That's gone. And I don't think that's ever coming back. It probably isn't coming back. So you know what you got to do? You got to work the edges. And I pointed this out in my column, Mike. You know, one of the reasons why, and look, I know there's a lot of people who hate you. There's a lot of people who like you, whatever. Huh. This has no, nothing to no, do with any no. of that. As long as this none of them no, live in this, this house, has, I'm fine with that. This has nothing to do with any of that. But my point is that I appreciate guys like Seth Wickersham, Don Van Natta, Mike Florio, because you work at places that have gigantic network uh, influencing contracts, like future of the networks at NBC, at ESPN, with, their, with the NFL contracts. And so there are these contracts, there are these business deals, and you have the ability to basically be, uh, an, as do Seth and Don, and look, there are others, to be an honest man in the, in the face of all that. And look, I'll, I'll only say this. It's like those, I, I don't even know those students at Northwestern. I have great admiration for them, the ones who blew the lid off the problems in their football program last year and got a lot of things changed in that football program. That's journalism. That has to be done. That There has to be a way, there has to be a path to continue to do that. And that's why I called out some people today, you know, in my column, Kalen Kaler and Jordan Rodriguez, The Athletic, are people who, they work the edges, they understand, they know how to get stories around the NFL. And so, and there are many others, many others, but it will be harder, will be tougher to do that. And look, I, I had a comment in my column a few weeks ago when I read that ESPN and the NFL were talking about some sort of partnership. I have no idea what it is. I have no idea what's going to happen. But all I said on that, uh, you know, when that happened was, you know, I feel sorry for journalism if that happens, because at least at ESPN, there is a segment of the place that is very, very in tune with trying to hold the NFL to account trying to hold Dan Snyder to account and trying to hold a lot of things that are going wrong in the NFL and, and trying to just simply call them out and say, hey, we should think of, be thinking about this. You do that. Those things simply cannot go away. And you had a lot of that honesty that would be embedded within your column that if you weren't looking for it, you might miss it. It just kind of naturally and organically flowed within the topics that you were covering, but you didn't pull punches and you experienced, I assume the same thing I have with NBC, hundred percent support of what we do. If there's heat to be taken, the bosses will take it. If they have to talk to us, they'll talk to us, but nothing changes. No one says you can't do that anymore. And I think we both have been trusted to speak the truth as we see fit, understand that we're not going to be gratuitous about it. We're not going to be mean about it. We're going to say what needs to be said. And we're going to try to point out the things that, you know, could maybe help the NFL. That's the thing that always pisses me off when they get pissed off. It's like, guys, I'm trying to help you. You're dangerously close to the cliff on a certain issue, and I'm trying to help you steer the car back on. Don't get mad at us for trying to tell you what we think you should do to try to avert disaster. Maybe one of these days you'll thank us. Yeah. I don't know. You know, look, the NFL is the all-powerful Oz right now. That's just the way it is. They're in a position that Mark Cuban thought they'd have been run over the cliff by now. But you know what? The hogs didn't get slaughtered. The hogs got fatter. And maybe the hogs will become uh, Goliaths at some point. I don't know. We don't know. There are obviously things on the horizon that they need to be careful about. Sports gambling, head trauma, all those things. I get it. Officiating. But look, you just have to cover, you just have to cover the league as honestly as you can. And that's the only thing that worries me about, you know, the media these days. You know, if you know what I said in my column. When Roger Goodell signs your paycheck, you know that you might be able to go to the edge of the cliff, but you're not going to go over it, or you risk becoming Jim Trotter. That's all there is to it. And well said. good for Jim Trotter, because he pressed the issue, 
and he got fired because of it, regardless of what is said. He got fired because of it. And look, we'll see what happens. I don't know the inner workings of that of that lawsuit or, or anything. I haven't covered it. But what I would say is that, look, the NFL really needs to have, honestly, needs to have some adversaries and not just three or four of them. And that is one of the things that worries me a little bit about the future of the media. Well said, and uh, I'll continue to be on that wall, even if there's one less voice on it in Peter King that can uh, help support me on some of these issues as we try to keep the NFL moving in the right direction. Because, look, I go back to when I was a kid. I fell in love with the mythology of football. The NFL can only blame itself for me putting it on a pedestal and expecting it to behave that way. That's it. That's it. The NFL put itself on a pedestal with me via NFL films and the booming voice of John Facenda in slow motion footballs wobbling through the air in snowflakes. And I just expect the NFL to act that way. That's it. Plain and simple. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.